Maybe it's just for us. Good evening, everybody. This is Robin with another edition of Horror Pop After Midnight. And my guest is filmmaker, writer, Whitney Wegman-Wood. And, of course, director Patrick Rea. How's it going, guys? Good. Going good? Going good. Yeah, um, this past weekend, I got a chance to see a Whorehound, but for a short time. So how much fun did you guys have at the Whorehound and Whorehound Film Festival this past weekend? It was amazing. I've, I had never been before, and I didn't know exactly what I was expecting, but it is huge. I um, It was a little overwhelming at times, like how much stuff there was and trying to plot out. You know, because I was like, look at a schedule whenever it comes to something like that, and I'm like, uh, this is priority, and this is priority, and try and plan everything out. But there was just so much um, that you just have to, you know, do what you can. Pick your favorites. <laughs> Yeah, this was my this was actually my fourth time attending and this was the biggest, I think, in terms of crowd. And I brought my I brought my my six year old daughter who the last time I was there, I wore her in a little backpack. So she was much easier to keep track of the last time I was there. This time it was like I had to keep one eye on her at all times because she wanted to run off into the crowd. But it was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Since it was your first time, Whitney, at Whorehound, what was your thought about the uh, film festival and meeting some of the uh, film goers and uh, filmmakers? Oh, I really enjoyed that. I actually, um, it was really fun. The hotel I was staying at, right away I met some people who were attending and I kind of overheard their conversation. I'm like, oh, are you guys going to Whorehound? And they had been going for about four years um, and like were very excited and kind of you know, gave me the ins and outs of it. It was a lot of fun um, meeting the the festival goers as well as I got to meet a lot of other filmmakers and, you know, talk shop, if you will. (laughs) Yeah, I've been going to Whorehound for a long time. Me, it's going on um, 15 years. (laughs) Wow. Wow. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, I'm an old timer. (laughs) Um, also at the Whorehound Film Festival, um, they have, you know, awards some ceremony where they give awards to films and congratulations for, uh, getting, uh, best writing in a short film at Whorehound for your film, The Last Butterflies. Thank you so much. Uh, that was, that was awesome. Like I said, uh, whenever I got up on stage, like it, was, it had been an amazing weekend and I was just sort of a cherry on top of the cake. Now, um, let's talk about Last Butterflies. It's a ap- apocalyptic horror story um how'd you bring uh patrick into the film as the director uh well so i've known patrick for a while um weirdly enough we lived in kansas city at the same time it never crossed paths but then years later i was at horrible magazines film festival and someone that i had gone to undergrad with sarah mcguire popped up on screen and i'm like oh my gosh i know her and then i watched the short and i'm like oh that was really good so i wrote patrick and um we ended up chit-chatting for like I don't know, like a couple of years, just yeah, yeah, you know, over Facebook and Instagram and the phone and stuff, you know, talking about like favorite Stephen King books and favorite horror films. So um, when we decided to film in Kansas City, like I called Patrick up. I'm like, hey, what you doing? And she sent me the script, and I really liked it. And uh, yeah, the rest is kind of you know uh, just how it all went. It was fantastic. It was, but it was it was very it was almost a whirlwind situation. I think you contacted me not that far from when we were filming, and it, it went pretty fast. And, and uh, it was a blast. Right. Yeah. Well, the whole thing was kind of whirlwind because I I had decided that I wanted to turn it into a film, like in. I wrote it back in 2019, but I made the decision that I'm going to film it in like June 2022. And then when I found out that we could get Cooper Andrews, but he only had like this very small window of time that was in November, I'm like, okay, everything gets expedited, fundraising quickly, <laughs> pre production quickly. So yeah, um, I think when did it. <sighs> I think I talked to you about it in like end of July, early August, maybe, Patrick. Yeah, yeah, and it's not still not a lot of time. I mean, it was, but so it was a pretty quick process. And you know, we we used um, all Kansas City Lawrence, Kansas crew uh, to make the film, and then a lot of people from Mountain City also volunteered and helped out with the film. Mountain City, Kansas. There's a Mountain City, Missouri, and there's a Mountain City, Kansas on opposite sides of Kansas City. Just to and make almost it almost equal distance too. It's yes, very equal distance, and so that just to make it confusing. But yeah, they were all very, very helpful. We shot six days total, and um, it was cold. It was you know, like I said, it was mid to late November, right before Thanksgiving. And so um, we were out in the woods and and uh, 
shooting and, and you know, and, and then we would have a big uh, bonfire to run to when we were finished. <laughs> so, but it, yeah, I mean, everybody was great and um, it was a very efficient shoot and, and uh, all the, the cast and crew got along swimmingly. So, yeah. Uh, that's pretty good because um, I've seen some of your stuff, Patrick, and um, since you were directing the film, um, I love some of your, your um, unique uh you know, directing styles in the film. Cause I can tell there was like a little Patrick Rea little touches in the film, um, you know, especially in the, in the camera shots on certain scenes. I was like, yep, that's what Patrick would do. And, and it's funny. Cause I've had people say that to me and it's, it's funny. Cause I don't, I, I guess as a, from a filmmaking perspective, I don't see it because I'm, I'm so used to just doing my thing and I, and I don't realize that, yeah, there's shots that are, that kind of mimic other shots from other films I've directed. So, um, I guess that's a good thing. I've developed the style, so. All right, Whitney. Let's... I, I think what I really like, sorry. Go what ahead. I really like, Patrick, is the fact that even though script-wise, you know, like this came from my nightmares, and it really is like a, a, a pretty strong drama because, like, you know, we make a lot of people cry, but it, it is horrifying. So, like, having a horror director, I think, really adds to the tension that is necessary uh, right. for the story, so. And we do have some effects work that's in there that's definitely, I, I, I was, when I was talking about in the Q&A after the screening, I talked about the uh, the artificial raccoon that we have in the film that, that uh, uh, Whitney's character finds it. And we had to, literally, we got a taxidermy raccoon and we put a bladder inside of it to make it go up, the stomach go up and down. And, and those are the kind of things that, yeah, that you, can, you just uh, have to have a little bit of horror directing to kind of, you know, get that right so we we enjoyed doing that and of course then we had to find real roadkill later <laughs> for, the, for the following scene but yeah no there was definitely um horror elements to it that i think pull, are pulled right out of uh today's headlines i think that when whitney had this this nightmare i don't think she saw knew how close to reality it was going to be uh by the time we made the film so yeah it was it's only gotten close to reality as we go <laughs> yeah i know exactly yeah, it uh, it does. Uh, watching this film um, is actually this could happen in real life, you know. Like you know, it could start like a civil war, and and I love how you filmed it because you really went more into the humanity and horror part of it. Like if something like that happened, if all the electronics were shut off and everything was lost and everything went to um, um, to hell. Um, Everybody would be getting in survival mode, you know, protecting their families, doing what they have to do just to survive. And that's like a straight uh, horror about that. And when you watch that film, you really feel the humanity side as yourself as you're watching the film. Because you can really picture yourself doing the same thing like how uh, Whitney and uh, Cooper Andrews' character and Ivy's character had to stay together as a family during this crazy crisis. What I also liked, what I liked about her script was that there was, you know, it's not a zombie apocalypse. It's not like a virus. It's, it's more uh, ecological, which I thought was kind of interesting and it hasn't been done uh, as many times as something like, you know, uh, the road or, or um, uh, even walking dead, <laughs> which, which also has Cooper Andrews. But uh, so yeah, so that's one thing I really liked about it was it was taking something that I think is uh, in in headlines now with with uh, global warming and such that um, yeah is 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 scary. I think it's actually more horrifying than any horror movie you can potentially think of. So yeah, and speaking of Cooper Andrews, when you're saying The Walking Dead, uh, we're so used to seeing Cooper Andrews in The Walking Dead and that type of you know scenario. Through the whole film, I was like hoping, going, is there going to be a zombie that's going to pop out? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cooper Andrews did a, a great performance. He nailed this role. I mean, he was being the strong, protective father, but he also had a little humanity in, in him to help the fellow man, you know, which he shouldn't be doing it. I guess he kind of, his character kind of see there could still be good, which is going around this craziness, you know, um, which is good, but it can also have a consequence. Oh, absolutely. And I think, I think that's the problem, right? Like if you get into these scenarios, you want to hope that we default to our better angels, right? That we all, and we, 
we're going to have it. But uh, that's not always the case. And historically, it definitely hasn't been the case because I, I did a little bit of research on like societal collapse whenever I was doing the second draft of this movie. And the tendency is that people, when, when things like this happen, they get more and more insular. So at first it's like, okay, um, I'm going to protect my community because they have my back and everything. And then as resources get even tighter, it's okay, I'm going to protect my family. And it just keeps on dwindling down to it's like, no, I'm in this for me. And that's just kind of like a built-in survival instinct that we have. So it's hard it's hard to default from that setting, which is biological, but I, I'm sure there will be people like Cooper's character that are able to default from that and do try and help. Um, but yeah, they, they may, you know, end up versus uh, somebody who's a little more desperate and it, it can get grim fast. Yes. So, um, I overheard that um, you're pretty good uh, friends with, uh, you know, Cooper Andrews. How'd you bring him to be part of this film? <laughs> uh, sneakily? Um, no, I uh, I sent Cooper the script kind of early on, and he read it and kind of gave me notes. And he's like, yeah, dude, what are you going to do with this? And I'm like, well, you know, I'm planning on turning it into a short. And I'm like, but I, I got to read through some of the SAG rules. And he's like, well, well Why? I'm like, well, because I, I would like to have a SAG actor in it. He's like, oh, who? I'm like, you. You would be great. I think you would be great at this role, Coop. Like, you bring all of the jovialness and love and care, and you'd be a great dad character. So that's how that went. That's pretty good. Um, Let's talk about the young actress. You worked with Ivy. I mean, Ivy did a pretty good job in the film, Um. So how much preparation did um, Ivy have to take to do this type of film and, you know, keep in character, you know, as this innocent child trying to survive with her mother during this crazy chaos? Patrick, you want to talk about this one? Oh, I, you know, I, I, it's always a little nerve wracking when you're working with somebody that young who, who hasn't got a ton of acting experience. Um, I ran into this with, with um, They Wait in the Dark. And I feel like I keep getting, you know, I'm very fortunate and the fact that I keep working with these these child actors who are really good and really really on it, and she was she was just one of those girls that she came in and she she would you know nail it in a few takes and and never complain and was super easy and uh, to direct. Um, her and Whitney definitely hit it off really really well. You could tell that there was a bond there, which helped you know obviously for the performance. And same thing with with Cooper; they felt like a real family, and so um, that definitely for me as a director makes my job a lot, a lot easier. Um, so, and we all, we are out in the cold and it's, it's one of those things where you, you don't have a lot of time to, to get a ton of takes because people are cold. And so um, she was just great. She was just easy to work with, never complained. Um, and, you know, we were out there for a lot of, a lot of time, you know, it was a long day. So um, again, like I, I can't speak highly enough of her. I think that she's got, future uh in the film biz if she wants to continue of course yeah um like i said she did um a, you know pretty good with whitney because like you said they had that mother-daughter bond through the whole film and um i love how she um portrayed her character she did it just like a little kid how a little kid would be witnessing everything but not thinking about all the bad stuff just thinking about you know all the good stuff how to survive trying to get uh, trying to get her you know parents together and try to go where they're supposed to be heading, where everything's supposed to be more peaceful and better when they're at. Um, I just like the the innocent touch of Ivy's character, which you know also kept you know Whitney's character a little bit in check about humanity as well as you know being a being a uh, you know badass mother, you know trying to survive and protecting her daughter, which is uh, definitely pretty cool. Um, and let's talk about the, the soundtrack of it a little bit. Um, who did the soundtrack of that? So that was, uh, Bobby Brader and Ben Adams. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. It really brought the attention and atmosphere into the film on around the characters, you know, where they're, you know, you know, trying to survive and uh, the whole movie. Um, I, I just felt the characters through me and, you know, when you get towards the end of the film without spoiling and everything, I'm not going to lie. I really felt 
my humanity coming out and feeling very sad and tearful. And I ain't going to lie, I had a little tear, you know, towards the end of this film. <laughs> Well, and, and one thing that oh, go ahead, go ahead, Winnie. Oh no, you go ahead. Okay, well, I'm a huge uh, uh, film score fan. I listen to a lot of film scores while I'm working, and um, I think one thing that we definitely agreed on is that this needed to have a very classically written orchestral score. Yeah, and we didn't want to overscore. I think that's one thing that um, sometimes filmmakers might tend to do is is put too much music in their films to the point where when it's it, it, when there's too much music, it's not impactful. So it, we definitely wanted to make sure that the scenes that had the score were the ones that um, really, really needed it. And so there are some quiet moments in the film where there's not as much music, and I think that that helps balance, and for an audience anyways, it makes the, the music more impactful for the, like the finale of the film. Um, but yeah, no, I, I it, literally when I heard the score, I had no notes. So that was, and that's a rare, rare thing. You know, you hear it, and you're like. Yep, this is right on the money. This is perfect. Um, yeah. I, Bobby and Ben have known each other for a really long time. Um, I want to say, gosh, over 10 or 15 years. So they work really well together. And I think the nice thing is it's so seamless. You can't tell which pieces Bobby created and which pieces Ben created because they, they, they work together that well. Oh, it sure did, because it also, like Patrick says, it it made the mood for the film. Your emotions felt the music, like he said in certain scenes. Um, I felt the emotion through the music. I kind of felt like it was part of the character in the film. Um, that's how, you know, um, I got, you know, the vibe, you know, through the, the, through the whole film. And like you said, you know, uh, music scores are very important, but not too much just to, you know, get it right there. Put, if you, right. If you put too much in there, it can become overly... Uh, overly, what's the word? I'm sappy, and and too, it's too working overtime to push the emotion. I think that uh, it, the movie does a very good job of balancing uh, those quiet moments with with scenes with with music. Now, um, Whitney, when you did this movie, this was um, based off your uh, little nightmares, and you had a little bit of insomnia when you were writing the script. So, when you finally wrote the script and finally started filming, was it kind of a little bit? hard for you to do it through all your uh, emotions and nightmares did that slightly come back while you were filming and writing the script <laughs> different nightmares nightmares about being a producer no longer nightmares about the end of the world it's, uh, <laughs> nightmares about you know catastrophic things happening on set um no actually i found the process of doing this very cathartic and um it's so weird because that last scene particularly without giving anything away when I The night that I wrote the script, I sat there and bawled my eyes out when I wrote it. The first time I read it to my mom, I got to that part and lost it, like, you know, big gulps of air between each thing. And I was a little worried that, you know, we'd get to that. It's like, oh, you know, I've lived with this for so long. I'm, I'm going to be like, it, it's not going to affect me anymore. But um, it definitely still did. Uh, I think having Ivy there, uh, that... I mean, all you have to do is look at Ivy and you're just like, oh my God, we failed this child and all children of, of her future ilk. And, you know, by the crushing guilt is, is definitely enough to push that scene forward. Um, so no, I mean, I the entire process was a catharsis for me. I didn't really have any nightmares. And um, for the most part, for reals, like during the week that we were shooting, I slept really well each night. Most of the <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Awesome. I'm glad you said it I don't know about you, Patrick, but I was just beat every night that we went, like, every night yeah. that we went, I was just, like, die in bed. Usually by day three or four, I'm finally sleeping, but then you're almost over half done. Um, yeah, no, it, it takes me a couple of days because I'm, my brain can't shut off after we film, and then I just sit mm. there wide awake thinking about the next day or something that I could have done better the day of, and so, um... Yeah, it really, when it's a feature and you're doing a, a shoot that's 12, 13, 14, 15 days, low-budget filmmaking, um, after the first six days, all of a sudden, I, I feel like I'm completely uh, at home with the project and I, I can kind of relax and just, and, you know, but when you're doing a short, it's, it's, there's a lot, it, it actually, it's, it's more of a sprint than a marathon sometimes, so, because um, you've got this very small window to get the film made, so, um my brain just goes into overtime 
or and just it doesn't shut off and and so i think it was day four or five where i finally my brain finally was like all right i can sleep eight hours maybe so yeah and this one more so than probably some other shorts we had a lot of moving pieces because at one point like cooper had to fly to la to go do a thing for walking dead it was like the finale and so we were really banking on like is he is he gonna be able to fly back in in time is there gonna be if there's a delay in the flight like that would really throw things off so there was a lot of like uh, time sensitive, like this has to happen. Then we were filming during COVID, and we had that uh, scene with all of the uh, extras. So we're like, nobody can test positive. <laughs> yeah, everybody had to test twice, I think, to step foot on set. It was the yeah. rule, and so um, yeah, and you're always a little concerned that you're even going to have enough extras to show up. That is literally something with indie filmmaking that people don't. It, it's very hard sometimes to get extras to come and actually show up. You can have a hundred of them sign up and then only 20 of them actually show up. So we were very fortunate that we actually had a good amount of, of extras um, come in yep. and do it. So we had like 35 people. It was great. Yeah. And it, what was interesting was that we shot what the first two or three days in Mound City, Kansas. And then we went to Kansas City and shot a couple days in Kansas City. And then we went back to Mound City um, to to finish shooting so there was a little bit of zigzagging um and all of that was just to, to be tailored the schedule was tailored to cooper's schedule to make sure that he could get in and, and film his scenes so um that those are things that like in the filmmaking process creating a schedule is one of the most complicated parts and um working with different people's schedules and making sure that people can show up working with locations to try to make sure that they can do certain scenes at certain days and such um, so it's always kind of a Rubik's cube making a, a film schedule, especially, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a short or a feature, it's always complicated. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the makeup on the film. Cause when I was watching it, you can notice the uh, makeup on, um, Ivy, you know, looked like her eyes were down and tired that, you know, you know, she's going on this journey, you know, hoping everything's going to turn out good. And you can see the despair of the makeup under her eyes that she's, really trying to struggle to survive with her mother. And that, you know, that was a progression that I think we really wanted to sell because, um, you know, they're clearly not getting enough to eat along the way and, mm -hmm. they're, and they're slowly starving. And so it, it definitely um, helps with the progression of the story and where the story is actually heading. Um, so that was definitely something that we discussed along the way. Yeah. We were fortunate enough to have two makeup artists on set. So we had Nicole... And then we had Jake Jackson for um, all of the, like the... And you know Jake, Robin. <laughs> you know Jake. Oh, of uh, course I know Jake. Um, yeah, yeah. So I... he's, the one who, he's the one who made the raccoon. And, uh, you know, again, we had way too much fun with that thing. But, yeah, we definitely, we had two makeup artists, Nicole Hobbs and uh, and Jake Jackson. And between the two of them, we were able to pull off a lot of, a lot of cool stuff, so... Yeah, I wonder who is this Jake Jackson guy? <laughs> <laughs> they keep popping up, I know. Um, but yeah, so um, and obviously we had the the, the scene at the at where where the people were in line to get the water. Yeah. We had some makeup stuff that day that was complicated, um, and really we had like basically one good shot at getting some of that makeup to happen. Um, so yeah, and again, that was another very very cold day where an actor might have lots of blood on them and be very, very cold because of that. But um, um, everybody everybody was great. It was, you know, um, one of the more fun short films I've ever worked on. So despite despite the story being very bleak. Yeah, yeah we, we laughed a lot and had a lot of good times despite that. And what was really fun, so when we were in Mound City, we rented this big Victorian house, and basically everybody was staying there, cast and crew alike. So yeah. it became like uh, kind of a big camp out. And I, I think that helped with the whole collaborative atmosphere because yeah, everybody would stay up, out. you know, have a couple beers and chat. And that's the kind of thing I prefer, you know, is, is that kind of family spirit of making a movie as opposed to something that's more like everybody goes to their separate hotel rooms or, <laughs> you know, um, their trailers. If you can afford such things, <laughs> <laughs> it's way more fun to do it this way, you know, and um, everybody was excited about doing it that way so whitney um have you ever thought um when you did this as a short film did you ever thought about maybe doing it as like a feature film <laughs> funny you should mention that <laughs> um yeah so when i first first wrote this it was interesting because i 
you know, I said that I wrote it back in 2019, and I, I talked to a film festival coordinator at the time, my friend Miguel, and I'm like, it's kind of long. I'm like, and, you, and he, his advice, of course, was either bulk it up to a feature or shorten it down to a short. Well, <laughs> I shortened it down as much as I could, and Patrick can attest it still wasn't that short. We still had to cut some things in the editing process. And it's still a long one. You know, it's a mid-length. Um, there's more story to this, for sure. And I don't know if it's going to manifest in the form of a feature film, or more likely, what I would be interested in doing is a short-run episodic. Because each of the characters that you meet in the short they, at least in my mind as the writer, have a longer character arc that exists. Um, Adam Boyer's character, the reason he's so quick to anger, there's a reason for that. You know, there's some background to him. Um, the gals who are at the water tank, the priest, everybody has a different place that they're coming from uh, emotionally and how they're dealing with the end of the world. And it's when you get all those personalities together that, you know, all the craziness ensues. So... I would love to have an opportunity to explore each of their character arcs because when it comes to something uh, as insane as contemplating what we would all do if we literally had the absence of hope, you know, the world is coming to an end. Do you hold out and find some little grain of like, I can figure this out. I can survive. Do you become a nihilist? Um, Do you become the best version of yourself, the worst version of yourself? or more likely variations in between. Um, And so I would love to explore that with each of our uh, sets of characters. That would be pretty cool because she can make like a universe out of it and use the, you know, the, uh, the character she's seen in the film and then they can uh, have a certain character that spawns off of them in certain situations, how, you know, they got where they're at as well. I think that'd be pretty interesting. I would definitely would love to see something like that. (laughs) Well, I'm talking to a couple people about it, so hopefully, you know, uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood, I don't know, talk to whatever deities you talk to, uh, we can get something cranked out here in the next couple of years. That would be, uh, that would be my dream. (laughs) That'd be awesome. That would be great. You guys are also big horror fans, too. Um, When you were doing uh, The Last Butterflies, did you ever thought about maybe doing like a little, you know, a little interest in like more like a uh, bloody kill scenes because you know like you're in a during the apocalypse area i mean things get pretty violent you know especially you know when you're have to fight to survive um so not for this one particularly because it was coming from my nightmare and at least for me a lot of my anxiety nightmares were surrounding the idea of motherhood okay um and so the the focus and relationship being the mom and the daughter was kind of um where my thoughts were at that time. If we spin it off into a short run episodic, um, there are a couple characters that I could definitely see um, having to navigate some more um, brutal situations because yeah, you would definitely have roving bands of people, you know, much like walking dead where it's like Mm -hmm. the strong men are going to take over. They're going to take your things and they're going to take your women and it's going to get dark really fast. Uh, So I definitely think it exists in this universe for sure. Hey, I, I, I'd be totally sold of that. And then, you know, get, you know, Patrick and Jake back on it, you know, like behind the scenes, which would be <laughs> pretty cool. Cause uh, Patrick, you and Jake, man, you guys are almost like brothers. You, you, um, you guys like think alike when you guys get together doing films. It's just, it's just brilliant. Yeah. We've been told that we need to do a, our own podcast and just talk about movies. Um, yeah, no, I just did a shoot with him. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it was like, yeah, we're definitely on the same on the same wavelength. <laughs> so, um, no, I, Jake has been working with me since I am Lisa, and so it's it's been it's been a lot of fun. He's super talented, and, and um, yeah. So, Whitney, since you did this kind of type of film, and you want to do an episodic of this, um, have you ever? Um, do you have any uh, other scripts? Of, do you think you are going to be? going doing more like going into the more of the horror genre of films oh lord i have a whole notebook full of ideas that span every possible genre um i have quite a few of the uh let's make everybody cry sort of heavy drama uh stories but um a lot of the horror things that i have would work as either features or 
I do have one cool idea for a, a horror episodic, Ooh. like true horror, like not not sci-fi, like Last Butterflies is, but like there's werewolves involved. <laughs> Oh, heck yeah, you gotta have werewolves involved, man. I would definitely like to check, and you better do that, because you know something, you got a friend for me, and I'll definitely hound on you until that gets done. (laughs) You'll hound on me? Yeah. Pun intended. Yep, pun intended. Get it? Hound on you? (laughs) But I'm shh. So Um, Also, you were, uh, you had a part in the Vampire Diaries, too, which was a great, fun series. What was that like to, um, to be on the Vampire Diaries. Oh, that was fun. Um, so that was when I had first, first moved down to Atlanta, uh, which is actually where I met Cooper. Um, I was just, I played one of the high school students, so like teeny tiny role, but um, I did get to chit chat with Paul Wesley uh, one of the days that I was on set. He's super nice. Uh, and I was just asking him, you know, like just business questions, like how did you get involved in acting and, you know, all that. And he actually came from a theater background, so we sort of hit it off pretty well. Uh, chit chatting about theater stuff. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, I enjoyed it. That's pretty cool, uh, Patrick. You've done all types of movies. Is there a certain genre of film that you want to do that you haven't stepped your foot into to do something different than what you have been doing? You know, like you know, uh, I mean, you know, I really, I, it's funny. I was talking to Whitney about it. I go back. I mean, I'd like to make. With the exception of maybe a, mus- a musical comedy or something like that, I would like to do Western at some point. I would like to do um, uh, a little bit more straight-up sci- science fiction. Um, not just, not sci-fi horror, but something that's just straight science fiction. Because um, you know, ultimately, sci-fi is what I was most interested in as, as a teenager. And then horror became my, my thing after that. So... Um, I've been, always been a big Star Wars guy, which I would consider more sci-fi fantasy. Um, but um, yeah, I would like to do more straight-up science fiction, um, or you know, a, a western. I, I I love I love drama, so I would love to do something more along those lines. But it would be a very dark drama. It wouldn't be a happy. It would be very very dark. So be the make you cry kind, like we were. Just- yeah, I'm I'm more attracted to stuff that's pretty bleak and and but i also want to do a horror comedy feature at some point uh and really just cut loose with the horror comedy aspect um because right now like i'll infuse a little bit of humor into my films but i haven't really my short films tend to be more horror comedy than my features so um and i don't know if that's because comedy scares me a little bit maybe and maybe that's why i should do uh, a horror comedy at some point because they seem extremely difficult to pull off correctly um, so there's only been maybe in, in, in my mind, like five or six that I think really knock it out of the ballpark and that have been, that have been able to blend horror and comedy, uh, perfectly, you know? I think Tucker and Dale versus evil is one of those. Yeah. I love that movie and I love scream and I think scream is a horror comedy just by what people might, I mean, it makes you laugh. So, I mean, Fright Night for me is probably one of the best perfect blends of comedy and horror, um, I'll tell you, um, one film, um, it was at Whorehound, uh, Film Festival, it was a werewolf, uh, movie Bite, and, um, it's supposed to be more like a serious horror, but, um, I laughed through the whole movie, I thought it was more like of a horror comedy, and, and the writer and director, he went on along with it, because that's what everybody kept on saying, you know, <laughs> because, um, it was about this app where these kids find this app, and he orders this vial of this this werewolf serum, and then you know they do a ritual, and it drops the blood on the app, and then all of a sudden someone ends up becoming you know a vampire and going on this crazy killing spree. So I thought it was more like a comedy horror than a serious horror. Interesting. But yeah, it's like well, you know, if you think about it, the original Evil Dead, they were taking themselves seriously until they realized like, oh, all <laughs> right. the rest this history. Since we're all big horror fans, I'm going to ask this for to you, Whitney and Patrick. What's your go-to horror film you can go to and just just enjoy yourself? Oh boy, that's tough. That's tough. I mean, there's so many. It's hard yeah. to narrow it down. I mean, I, I literally, it's like every week there's a different one. That I, I mean, I, for me, like I have so many '80s horror movies that I love, uh, from the original Friday the Thirteenth to Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, Return of the Living Dead, 
Um, you know, I could just go on and on. And so every week I'm like, oh, Life Force is on. I'm just going to put my foot feet up and watch that movie, you know? So it's hard to just pick one. It, it, I know there's, there's, it'll change from week to week. Yeah, I, uh, I know. So JK tagged me in this thing where it's like top 15 horror films, you know, like post one a day. And I made a list and had to whittle that down, which was really yeah. challenging. Um, and still, like, you know, 15, that, that should be a good amount. Um, I really love old school Candyman. Uh, that's definitely one of my favorites. Um, I So, not to be a kiss-ass, but I did put Patrick Ray's movie, They Wait in the Dark, as one of my top 15. Uh, because the I, I love when a horror movie, if I can't guess the, the ending... Like, I mark that as a, a big deal because, you know, I write a lot. So I'm always guessing the ends of movies. And, of course, I'm yeah. leaning over my husband being like, you know what's going to happen? He's like, don't tell me. Write it down because yeah. I want to prove myself right. But he doesn't want to know the ending 15 minutes in. Uh, I, I never guessed Patrick's ending. So that really got me. That was great. I, I want more people to put that movie on their list. So, you know, hopefully you, st- you started a trend with me. I, <laughs> actually, it's great. actually, they wait in the writing like that <laughs> yeah actually they wait in the dark was actually a pretty good movie i mean i saw a whorehound and i still need to definitely get that into my physical media library i still need to get that film well it, it, i don't know when it's going to have a physical media release is the, is the very very frustrating part right now i mean it's it's one of those things where we're in a situation where i don't think the distributor is going to do one so we may it may be a little while before that happens but hopefully it happens relatively soon I hope so too, because it was actually great, and I do agree with Whitney. It kept me guessing, and I just love the cast in the film. I mean, that film really did keep me on the edge of my seat. So um, um, when I saw the film, I was like giving word of mouth to everybody to check it out. And you know me, Patrick, you and Jake were sitting there going, "Man, you're like spreading that movie like it's like hot pancakes or something." But yeah, I want everybody to see this movie. It was actually pretty great. So. Um, oh, Go ahead, go ahead. You're, you're fine. Oh, go ahead, Patrick. No, I'm just, I was just going to do a little self-promoting on that movie. It's on Crackle right now. It's on Tubi for free. It's on um, it's still on Vudu and Redbox and all that stuff. So, yeah, I would definitely check it out. It's one of those movies where I hope it builds a, a following in, in, over the years and such. So, you know, um, I th- you tell people you like it. Yeah, it's really well done, and the writing is is excellent. Because it's it's rare that I watch a movie and don't guess guess the ending until it's like, oh shit! I think I <laughs> I think I called you up afterwards. I go, damn, but you got me. I didn't, you know. And the funny thing is, writing it, I didn't really think of it as a big surprise until like everybody started watching and telling me they didn't see it coming. And I'm like, all right, well, because you lose all of that objectivity when you're making a film. You you just you, you've looked at it for so long, and you're like, oh. Okay, I guess there's a surprise here because I, you know, I obviously wanted it to be a twist, but um, yeah, I mean, after editing the movie and all that, it just you start to kind of lose that, and until you start showing it to people, it, it, you don't really know if it's going to work. Yeah, exactly. So, um, where can everybody find you on social media and some of your upcoming projects you guys are going to be doing? Patrick, you want to go first? Um, yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm under Patrick M. Ray, R-E-A, uh, on Facebook and on Instagram. And I'm also on t- uh, TikTok, though I don't, I'm not, I'm not really posting much on TikTok as much as I'm just watching stuff on TikTok. But yeah, I'm definitely more active on, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook. And I generally, I'm, I'm posting mostly on Facebook and Instagram, so. I'm looking forward to that found footage as well, so. Yeah, hopefully it'll be done soon. I mean, we're hoping that we can do a, a first first uh, film festival screening in the late summer. Fingers crossed. And you, Whitney? Um, so I can be found on pretty much all the social media platforms under Whitney Wegman Wood. And I'm most active on Instagram. There's also uh, WhitneyWegmanWood.com. And then for the for the film, there's the lastbutterflies.com. And on all social media, you can find it on either at the last butterflies or at the last butterflies film. I think that covers everything. And uh, as far as seeing the last butterflies, we are going to be at Kansas City Film Festival Film Festival International coming up uh, April 13th. 
After that, we have a screening down in Georgia in May. That's a little town right outside of Savannah. And then we have been approved for Toronto and Bratislava, Slovakia. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, you know how those type of people love their whore anyway. They live that like 24-7. <laughs> But anyways, hopefully they, hopefully they enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, they should. I really enjoyed it too. Um, guys, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, thank you, Patrick. It's always a pleasure you. seeing you. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. And Whitney, it was great to meet you at Whorehound as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you're doing next. I wish I could have talked to you a little bit longer, but you know, like I was running around with my head cut off. You know, I had a lot of people coming up to me going. How come you didn't say hi? How can you come by? I was like, I'm busy covering the film festival, getting interviews, man. I barely got a time. Yeah, you were a little busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. But anyways, you guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And everybody, thank you for listening to Horror Pop After Midnight. Have a great